So I was tasked to talk about the use of cardiac MRI from a diagnostic to a decision-making tool, and I have to confess that by uh, trying to prepare this topic here was no easy task because cardiac MRI has definitely had a huge impact in many uh, facets of our day-to-day -day practice. I thought about, you know, focusing over the next 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes into one topic, or maybe two topics, coronary artery disease, and a little bit about mitral regurgitation, and give, obviously, to our group some updates on where we stand as far as the current indications, contraindications for cardiac MRI, talk about chest pain, ischemic MR, some directions and opportunities of our group. So we are in 2020, whether we want or not. It's uh, been quite of a year, um, to say the least. Uh, but in 2020, lots of things we need to revise about the use of cardiac MRI. Um, it is expensive. Those are some myths that I put together. It is not available everywhere. Um, but if you come to think about MRIs are available everywhere, why not cardiac, right? You can do a brain, you can do a back, but not cardiac. It requires, obviously, a lot of uh, preparation technique. It cannot be done with patients with implantable devices or RCDs. Those are some conceptions. Uh, the information obtained is fun, but it's not actionable, and it doesn't change management. And just for the price cost here, these are hospital payments. You can see the CMR with contrast, um, you know, it gets paid about 386 Actually, it's cheaper than echo without contrast, and if you put contrast, uh, you almost double the price here. So... The value of that is that we can see tissue uh, like in pathology like no other uh, technique. This is a 48-year-old male with new onset chest pain and a very high positive troponin of 14. He did not have COVID, and I'm not going to elaborate about the impact that MRI might have in these patients. There's a lot of controversy and a lot of actual misinformation, misconstruct. Um, but this was a bona fide myocarditis. Did not have coronary artery disease on angiogram. He had preserved EF, but you can see this area of increased water or edema, swelling, inflammation in the epicardial area, which is confirmed by his late gadolinium enhancement imaging, and therefore a case of myocarditis. It's another one, a 40-year-old female with chest pain, unremarkable EKG, dyspnea, a borderline very low level troponin elevation with normal angiogram, and you can see on the arrow sign here that, that there is a very discreet area of subendocardial scar, infarct, the MVO, elevation of water as well, edema, and you can see this. And actually, you look at the coronary CT that you had the same day, you can see why. There is a plaque right immediately before the first uh, diagonal, I'm sorry, septal perforator, and uh, that created the embolic uh, infarct uh, for this patient. There was no SCAD. So why I'm showing these two cases? Because now is a class 1B indication. I uh, should be performed in all patients that present with this entity of myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries, uh, Minoka, uh, because it can identify what is the cause. Um, it can be Takatsuba, it can be myocarditis, it can be an embolic MI. And then this is actually part of our practice. I mean, they come to think about, we do this routinely and we really appreciate because um, it helps us to tease out, obviously, the etiology and then prognosticate and then treat patients accordingly. Uh, because not everything that elevates the troponin is obviously MI, as we know. Another update is that, as you saw probably last week, um, that GFR below 30 is not a contraindication for gadolinium use anymore. Uh, this has changed. Uh, has changed already in our lab. It has changed in the radiology department. It's going to be changing a line wide. Uh, this came to uh, uh, an update from the American College of Radiology to say that the risk of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis is extremely low to almost non-existent um, when done with a very long time scrutiny of almost 15 years by showing that this new, what we call macrocyclic agents, is what's, what we use here, Gadavist, has been no case zero. And therefore, this could open up the possibility to evaluate these patients, not yet on dialysis. Those are some centers that are already joining. We are not there yet, but definitely below 30 is not a contraindication anymore. Also, an update that all intracardiac devices, conditional, conditional, legacy, pacemakers, ICD, CRT, micro, loop recorders, are all safe. Um, there is no more this entity that we cannot do because patient has a pacemaker. Um, we should update our understanding. We require uh, updating and coordination with the EP service uh, 
There are dedicated CMR sequences that we use in our lab to reduce the artifact. You can do perfusion, you can do viability, you can do amyloid, sarcoidosis screening. The only thing are those in abandoned intracardiac leads. If they have been disconnected or fracture leads, uh, we tend to obviously risk the balance between the risk and benefits. If there is an alternative such as CT, we can do uh, some good evaluation of that. And this is just an example to show that CMR, even in the presence of defibrillators or pacemakers, can be done. It can produce some artifacts, um, as you can see here, but still capable of evaluation for valvular disease and biventricular function. Some sequences are required. This is the conventional uh, late catalytic enhancement imaging. You can see that, that there is substantial artifact, and with the new sequence, wideband, so-called, we can clearly see where the infarct is. Examples from our lab as well here, showing conventional sequence, sequence with the defibrillator, with a special sequence flash. This is a perfusion case, but you can see that there is a perfusion defect seen in the map. This is the late gadolinium enhancement imaging. And even because we have the sequence, it doesn't mean that we should pay, not pay attention to small things, such as just you know, raising the left or the right arm, whatever the generator is. It can move the can a little bit out, and you can have a diagnostic image. So, you know, not because we have the sequence, we should uh, not pay attention to the small details. And even in patients that have mitroclip, for example, here, uh, quantification of valvular regurgitation, even in the presence of atrial fibrillation, in patients that have pleural effusions, as you can see here, this is totally fine. Um, in fact, the triluminate study that we are part of, a lot of these patients are in this situation here, and we can get a beautiful diagnostic studies. Um, this is just an example of this particular scenario in which the same patient, same scanner, but just changing the sequence. You come from a non-diagnostic image to a totally diagnostic study. One of the importance here was obviously the development of uh, this free breathing motion correction. On the left side here, you can see the same patient being imaged with a traditional late gadolinium enhancement imaging, completely non-diagnostic, a lot of breathing motion artifact to a completely diagnostic. And this is what we use in our lab. It's robust and is reliable. It delivers all the time. And we could not have done this without this guy, uh, Dr. Peter Kalman uh, from the NIH. Uh, Peter has received his PhD from Stanford and has been there for more than 20 years. Um, he worked for the National Security uh, for a few years and then now has been at the NIH um, for the long time of his career. He has been awarded earlier this year the SCMR Golden Medal Award. And through this collaboration that we have developed, um, and thanks to him, to entrust in us this, um, his know-how and his development, we have been able to provide all of those great uh, techniques. And now we are in the global map. Uh, this is just showing that Minneapolis Heart Institute is one amongst many other centers that he is providing uh, this great knowledge uh, through cloud services and binning and um, things like that. You know, this is a, in the endocardial infarct, um, we can see that some endocardial extension, but sometimes it can be difficult to see um, and with this dark blood, you can definitely see the delineation. So, because for you to see what is bright, you need to be a little bit gray. But if everything is bright signal, you're not going to be able to discern what it is. This is another example as well here, very small subendocardial infarct. Or even in non-schemic scar, like in the case of sarcoid, you can see this RV uh, involvement as well from the septum, from the right ventricle into the septum. But I came here to talk about coronary disease. These are just updates from our uh, program. And for coronary artery disease, um, we obviously uh, need to look into the Europeans. They're always ahead of us in terms of the forward thinking. Um, in terms of the spectrum of coronary artery disease, we need to obviously understand what is the likelihood of obstructive coronary disease. And definitely coronary CT is one of the main technologies that we currently use and available here in our practice to evaluate whether this chest pain is from coronary disease or not, and that should remain as such. When the likelihood of coronary disease increases or in the presence of already established coronary disease exists, perhaps the imaging for ischemia or functional imaging should be considered, and that's where cardiac MRI in this low to intermediate risk should be considered. MRI is a very uh, versatile tool, as we know, uh, function, Within the same study, you can get function, you can get scar, you can get microvascular obstruction, sometimes microvascular hemorrhage, edema, inducible ischemia. You can do strain imaging, you can do perfusion maps, you can look at the fibrotic burden of these ventricles 
by just injecting gadolinium. You don't need a different tracer. You don't need to bring the patient next day. You don't need to give radiation. All with one single test you can answer. This sometimes can be our blessing, can be the curse, because you know, the more you try to obtain, the longer the study can become. So you know, just a point that we need to obviously be mindful of that might take some time, but we can get everything into one single study and as a comprehensive evaluation. But I came here to emphasize about the need for us to consider stress perfusion MRI. And this has come through almost 30 years ago when a first radiology paper by Atkinson showing the single center validation, then by Schwitter from uh, Europe, then Eichenegel from uh, Germany showing the first single center vendor, and then multi center in 2014, then in 2008, 2010, multi vendor centers, and then 2012, the CE Mark trials, 2016 showing that CMR had a superiority in terms of detection of coronary artery disease above um, SPECT, and therefore has become really the established perfusion technique <coughs> for the evaluation of coronary artery disease. So a long time coming through this journey to the building of the evidence for these patients. This has been already validated against angiography and PET, and you can see here the numbers are pretty much comparable particularly for the detection of subendocardial ischemia. And this is data from the United States. When the United States decides to come in, um, then we have big numbers. So 48,000 patient years follow-up showing that abnormalities seen by ischemia stratify better these patients, even in the absence of coronary disease, of known CAD, even in the absence of hyperenhancement, which is the late enhancement here, even in patients that have normal ejection fraction or even those abnormal ejection fraction, the presence of ischemia, perfusion, is bad and should be considered. So if you have a patient with that and you wanted to do a perfusion versus taking them to the cath lab and doing FFR, um, could MRI be the gatekeeper? So to say, you know, this is safe. You can wait and you don't need to do that. And this is what this trial has shown, um, the MR informed by Ica Nago, almost uh, 1,000 patients that have been evaluated, but you can see that the event rate, this is actually in a scale from 0 to 100. At the end of one year, they are superimposed, and this is, they blow it up, but you can see that the event rate is very low. It begs us the question, should we do any testing, if any, right? I mean, that's one thing that we always have to consider when we see patients, do we need to do any testing? But if so, then it might be that CMR uh, could be a gatekeeper to avoid an invasive angiography or sometimes even a coronary CT. So we have three randomized trials. We have um, the CE Mark I, we have the CE Mark II, uh, showing the unnecessary angiography um, by using the NICE guidelines was 29% versus 7.5%. That's using CT up front. Um, with CMR is much smaller, and the MR informed that I just show you. And now, United States. Just building the evidence, you know, this is amazing that over the last two years we have had so much about stress CMR, to showing that it's not only looking at the LGE or the scar, but looking at the presence of ischemia. The outcomes would differ, obviously, the worse for those that have ischemia and LGE, as you can see here. But again, a lower event rate. It, is, it reduces the downstream testing. This is within the United States. Um, it could be very cost effective in this methodology to screen patients that do not need to undergo cardiac uh, catheterization. This is a recent publication also from the United States. 13 centers, 582 patients with a mean ejection fraction of 39%. And we can see that in these patients, it's not only about having the scar that it's present um, you know, very commonly in these patients, but also the presence of ischemia. Even in those that have ejection fraction between 40 to 50 percent, you can see that the event rate is much higher <coughs> six years, but even within two years, you already see a separation. And even in those that have ejection fraction less than 40. So when we consider viability, should we do stress viability, uh, similar to some of these patients that uh, Dr. Berlakis and the many others here deal with as well in chronic total occlusion, and many of these other patients. In whom, then, if we can identify ischemia, should we consider revascular? So this is updating in 2020, a paper from Spain, uh, almost 6,400 patients with non-suspected stable ischemic heart disease, risk of all-cause mortality, 
uh, which grew in parallel to the ischemic burden. The more ischemia you have, the worse the outcomes, adjusted for all these covariates. And they see that this inflection point starts to occur um, at a small number of segments, and particularly when they were able to match one-to-one -one risk factors, those that got revascularized versus those that did not get revascularized, for the same burden of ischemia, they saw that this inflection point that crosses at about five segments, so presence of five segments, um, they can be associated with, and you can see here, one, two, three. You know, you have at least uh, three segments, if not more, perhaps uh, four or five. They should be revascularized and should be considered if medical therapy has failed. But the big elephant in the room is that in the United States of America at the present time, you see that in 2017 there were more MRIs done in UK than the entire United States. In London, that's not UK actually, which is not part of a European community. UK, London, it's part of the, <laughs> they have more MRIs than the United States. But obviously it doesn't capture private pairs, uh, which are you know, an important contribution here. But even if you look at the ischemia trial that has been recently published, 50% of these patients under conservative arm um, were randomized to either SPECT or stress EKG, stress echo, and stress CMR in 4.9%. So it's a, a very underutilized. And in 2013, the rate of SPECT to coronary CT ratio was 58 to 1. So that's amazing. So it's, that's what we see in day-to-day -day practice, even in some of our satellites. For an older technology that sometimes bigger patients have to come two days in a row and be injected twice because they're so big that the radioisotope cannot provide us diagnostic quality. We are in 2020 and we should be updated into what we can do. Uh, those are the real new reimbursement rates that have been proposed for 2021. Uh, there has been an increase in the reimbursement for stress cardiac MRI. Um, but you, when you look at the proposed payments, um, you know, stress MRI and stress and CMR are pretty much uh, in the same ballpark. Um, you see CT is by far the cheapest and the most cost effective. Um, it's uh, actually um, a problem that we are trying to promote because it is a test that provides you so much and it's been reimbursed the same as a hand x-ray um, that does not account for the preparation of the patient, the medications that are used, the interpretation. So it is uh, a big conundrum. Um, but if you do then an FFRCT, then you at the much more expensive rate. But look at the price for SPECT or for PET. Um, they're in three times the order of magnitude for that uh, when we can do all of that. So we pay more, but probably we get similar value or if not less. Uh, that's something that might and needs to change. And I think one of the changes that we're embarking into here in our center is this capability of doing quantitative perfusion mapping. Um, on the left side, you have the visual assessment. Let me play this again. Um, you have, obviously, you can see the perfusion defect. Sometimes it's uh, subjective. You need to pay attention to it. But when you let the computer do the, then the segmentation, provide you this perfusion maps, then it becomes much more objective. And this is not only for single vessel disease, you can see this perfusion defect here involving the RCA predominantly, but also in the presence of triple vessel disease that we can evaluate this very clearly. Even in patients that have multivessel coronary artery disease, the case here infarct in the uh, anteroseptal area, LAD distribution, as well as in the RCA, you can see that when you compare the rest images with the stress images, this infarct in the RCA, the ischemia, uh, seems to match, but when you do the perfusion maps, it goes beyond that, it goes beyond the infarct, and also now you can see scheme in other territories. So in the presence of multivessel disease, it improves, even for centers that don't have a lot of experience, the capability to visualize that. This has been validated against FFR uh, and showing an excellent correlation. This is rest, this should be all blue in stress, this should be nice and salmon pink. And you can see here in this patient that had stenosis in the LAD, you can see a nice correlation there with the FFR. And the stress myocardial blood flow has an excellent area under the curve and should be the method that nowadays we are using in our center. It has also been validated against PET 
and you can see here for this patient that had also RCA ischemia, it matched nicely with the PET, it has a very good correlation of myocardial blood flow by PET versus CMR. And even in the presence of three vessel disease, when you would look at the PET images and you would say, oh, this is rest, this is stress, maybe we see a little bit of some lateral wall ischemia, but we don't see much by MRI. When you do the quantitative assessment, this global stress myocardial blood flow is quite decreased, and this is a triple vessel disease. So you could underestimate by just looking at the qualitative assessment. That's why we need to be quantitative. Um, and our PET scanner also can provide this quantitative, although not reported on a routine basis, but it should be considered. And obviously not all that wheezes is asthma, right? Um, and the surrogate of that is not that all causes angina ischemia, is epicardial coronary disease. And we know that, that we have a lot of these patients that come to the coronary CT with chest pain and you do the coronaries, there are some 20, 30 percent lesions. They have patent stents, but they still have in chest pain. Why is that? Could this be a problem of the microvasculature? And so FFR um, identifies, obviously, epicardial coronary artery disease, significance of stenosis, and maximal hyperemia. There is a very nice correlation between flow and pressure, a linear correlation. But in the presence of microvascular disease, one needs to look at this thing called index of microvascular resistance. And the greater this value, above 25, the more likely that you would have problem in the branches of the branch. And this can be calculated invasively here by the multiplication of the uh, mean um, is it by thermal dilution. The, the distal pressure versus uh, the mean time um, to achieve hyperemia. And this is just a picture that I, I found on the, one of the presentations uh, showing that you can obtain both the FFR and the pressure distal and you have uh, the mean time for hyperemic flow and you can um, then multiply, multiply this and you have the uh, obtaining IMR, or index of microvascular resistance. And these are patients that uh, were evaluated in this paper by UK without epicardial coronary stenosis, and they had measurement of the IMR invasively. And then they had, obviously, the MRI. And you can see here in this patient with a low IMR of 11, there was nice augmentation of the myocardial blood flow up to four, and in patients that have impaired coronary uh, microvascular disease, impaired increased um, index of microvascular resistance, the myocardial blood flow cannot augment. And could this be a way that we could evaluate these patients uh, for microvascular disease, which is a vaccine diagnosis to be made? These are, uh, this is another example of a patient with normal resting myocardial blood flow they did the invasive IMR, and the RCA was quite elevated at 58. Elevated in the LAD as well, but normal in the CERC borderline. And you can see that this, instead of being completely nice and orange or yellow, which is a normal patient, uh, this patient had all this kind of patchy. It was not completely normal to show that this is the presence of microvascular disease. And how good is that test? Um, it's still under development. Um, we are um, also doing this on a routine uh, basis and evaluating this uh, critically. Um, it has found in about two-thirds of these patients the correct classification. You can see the number of patients is not uh, too large. Um, but, you know, we still have um, the opportunity here to be providing um, not only the evaluation of perfusion, the absence of perfusion defects, but then quantify how much of that blood flow could be augmented. And we are the only center outside of the NIH in the United States to be able to do this quantitative myocardial blood flow assessment without no radiation. These are two different patients, two women presenting with chest pain, one that um, has completely normal resting myocardial blood flow, and then with the stress becomes salmon pink colored, right? It augments quite well. And this other one that goes from 0.9 to only 1.9. It did not augment the myocardial blood flow. And there is no epicardial coronary artery disease and therefore the diagnosis of microvascular disease. So now we can get to that assessment um, in addition to many other things. Quantification of myocardial blood flow is important. This is a paper by the James Moon who was here with us earlier this year from UK, 
uh, more than a thousand patients, two center studies using the same technology, this automated artificial intelligence derived quantification of myocardial blood flow and myocardial perfusion reserve. And what they show are these two measurements, how much of the myocardial blood flow augments with the stress, as well as the perfusion reserve, which is the ratio of stress divided by rest. They provide incremental value beyond identification of ischemia. So it's not, not only you have ischemia, don't ischemia, but what is your total myocardial blood flow? And think about stress myocardial blood flow, you want it to be two or above, and the perfusion reserve being around 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, that's the ratio between the stress and the rest. And you can see that that pan out for both deaf as well as major cardiovascular events after you do many, many adjustments. So now it's not only you see or you don't see the perfusion defect, we can quantify and that quantification has a meaning to it using uh, this technology. So I hope that I have made to you over the last 20 minutes a value proposition that stress MRI has definitely a value. It's safe, it's accurate, there's no radiation. One test can provide you many um, answers to questions that you might have. It's cost effective. Less extra testing because you decrease the downstream um, testing. Uh, there is a financial value, uh, healthy revenue now that is improving. Obviously there's the academic value for research and personalized medicine. It's better for patients, hopefully for doctors too, for the healthcare system and payers. Um, and particularly now, the new era of quantitative myocardial perfusion will expand our understanding of not only epicardial coronary disease, but I believe also into the microvascular disease. And we're working closely also with Scott and uh, we too from our group to understand this through an arm of the warrior trial uh, for patients with chest pain without obstructive coronary disease. How do we order this test? Um, so if you're interested, you go into EPIC. You just type cardiac MR. If you type cardiac MRI with that I, it will take you only to stress. That's okay. But if you type cardiac MR, then you have the two options. Either you have the stress cardiac MRI, or you have the traditional myocardial infarction or viability study. If you are somebody that goes by numbers, 75561 is without stress, and 75563 is with the stress. And uh, they will go and there is a type of stress and we are using at the present time Lexiscan or Ragadenazan, although this will be changing um, in the near future to adenosine just for the fact that all these trials that I have shown that have used adenosine, uh, in, uh, Ragadenazine is much more convenient, is one dose for patients, but now that we can measure blood flow, uh, we can see that the resting myocardial blood flow, even after amnophilin, does not revert to normal. Some of these patients remain hyperemic. Um, and that, that could be a problem when you calculate the ratio, right? The perfusion reserve, because the, artif the rest myocardial blood flow, since we do stress before rest, is going to be elevated. So uh, something that will be coming, but you don't need to worry about that. That's how uh, we order. And there is also a proposition that, you know, do uh, we need to be that complex or, or that long? You know, this is a... Proof of concept study from um, Leeds in UK, 18 patients only, but they were able to do this very abbreviated protocol. Um, you do start already with the stress images. With adenosine, there's no rest perfusion. You do the short axis CINES after adenosine, which has some problem in the quantification of ejection fraction, um, perhaps that might augment tachycardia. And then you finish up with the late gadolinium enhancement images. And all the study here within less than 20 minutes. So this could be very uh, effective. Uh, we're not there yet, but we are much better than lots of other places um, that, you know, block an hour and a half. We are doing this within 50 minutes, 45, 50 minutes um, for a very comprehensive study with stress and rest and myocardial blood flow quantification. That is just visual. And then finally, obviously, I cannot uh, come here without talking about valvular heart disease, which is obviously something that uh, is uh, near, dear our um, heart and, and passion, especially trying to understand this conundrum of ischemic mitral regurgitation. And you heard from Dr. Serrano a couple weeks ago, uh, his perspectives about, you know, the quantification of mitral regurgitation. Uh, but there's still a lot to be learned about ischemic MR. You probably recall a couple years ago, there were these two randomized controlled trials that came. 
Uh, on the left side was MitreFR industry, not industry, but um, investigate initiated study uh, in France. 304 patients uh, randomized to either MitreClip versus um, goal-directed medical therapy, um, followed by 12 months, and there was no significant difference between these two interventions. As opposed to the COAPT, the double number of patients followed for two years. Uh, there is actually a two-year data from MitreFR that shows no difference. Uh, again, it was just published last year. But COAPT, up to two years, they were randomized to MitroClip and medical therapy versus medical therapy. Again, this was a very strict trial for its enrollment, as well as to the candidacy of these patients, uh, because they had to have failed medical therapy, sometimes device therapy with CRT, then to receive MitroClip. Uh, there was the overseen by heart failure. And needless to say that this trial was very positive with the number needed to treat of only 4.5. Um, if you look at the inclusion criteria, 63%, 61% of these patients had ischemic cardiomyopathy. So why one is very positive and the other one is very different? Um, so some theories have emerged. One of them is this um, issue about proportional, disproportionate severe MR uh, by Dr. Paul Grayburn uh, from Baylor, Texas. He uh, proposed that Perhaps patients in the COAP trial had a lot of mitral regurgitation measured by EROA to ventricles that are not substantially dilated. So the main driver here is the mitral regurgitation. By fixing the MR, you might do some good. As opposed to mitral FR patients, that there was some mitral regurgitation, but the ventricles were far dilated, and this was the out of proportion, or much more ventricular disease, whereas the mitral regurgitation would be a, an important bystander. But again, there is no data about patient data into this graph. Um, it uses a Gorlin equation with a fixed ejection fraction of 30%. It assumes a mitral regurgitant fraction of 50%, which is quite high by MRI lens. And there is no clinical validation. And one of the problems that I'm starting to hear uh, from, you know, in, in sessions and debates is that patients, uh, some centers are already calculating this and say, oh, you fall into the disproportionate proportion we should fix. We ought to be careful about this because uh, we need more data, and we need to look at this more critically. So there is some work uh, in which he took the COAP groups and tried to plot now a different ratio, the ratio now of the EROA to end diastolic volume. So think about this way, EROA denominator, LDV, EDV the denominator. So the higher that ratio, the more mitral regurgitation you would have to the ventricular remodeling. Therefore, these patients to the far right, they would probably do better because the main driver is the mitral regurgitation. But you can see that even within COAP, there were patients that look like mitral FR. Again, that Venn diagram, right? It's not that they do not overlap. There is an overlap. COAP patients that look like mitral FR, mitral FR that look like COAP. So you can see that the mitral FR patients had much more remodeling, LVDV, to the degree of ROA. Then there is the group from Leiden, uh, Professor Bax, um, now proposing a different ratio for this cohort of patients of a little over 300 patients. The ratio between the regurgitant volume by echo divided by EDV by echo. And both of them have actually problems in their calculation, uh, in their inaccuracy. So maybe by doing the ratio, it might cancel these inaccuracies. But what you saw is that after almost um, you know, four years, five years almost, the curves start to separate. But you see that the confidence interval is quite <laughs> wide. And, when, and the devil's in the, detail, and it's in the details, right? So when you look at that table two, um, the calculation of regurgitant volume by PISA, uh, 2D method versus the Doppler method, you can go from a regurgitant volume of 34 to all the way to 174. Wait a second, so if the regurgitant volume is 174 and the left ventricular volume is 189, that means the entire ventricle is occupied by regurgitant volume, which doesn't make sense. Um, so there are problems with this uh, paper, um, and this is another publication that has come to show that you cannot do this reliably by echo because you're assuming many things. And you do so many calculations that at the end is a hodgepodge. Um, and you cannot be precise. So I would pause into the question about proportion and disproportionate because are we, <laughs> can we provide a better measurement of this? Um, and this is a publication that is in press right now. 
eject imaging. So the MITRE-FAR investigators took the whole cohort of MITRE-FAR and they tried every single parameter, regurgitant volume, ROA, above or below, the ratio, the LDV, and there was no subgroup that benefited from MITRE-CLIP in their cohort. So uh, we ought to be careful uh, with this and perhaps, you know, in the ischemic MR population, the issue is a bit more complex just rather than just the proportionality of volumes and how accurate uh, these are. Um, I think the issue here has to do with obviously the amount of scar that we can measure by many techniques, um, including nuclear studies or sometimes even um, stress, uh, dobutamine viability, although much more less accurate. Uh, and I'll propose obviously since the talk is about MRI, that we could do this as well. And this is work that I had the chance to get involved with back when I started my fellowship at Cleveland Clinic. 578 patients, everybody has ischemic cardiomyopathy with a very low ejection fraction, and they got the quantification of mitral regurgitation by MRI as well as the SCAR. And what you could see is that the more mitral regurgitation these patients have, the worse the outcome, which you could say is the same by looking at EROA. Um, but this inflection point starts to occur at the very low regurgitant fraction. By the way, regurgitant fraction is the amount of regurgitation, the regurgitant volume, divided by the stroke volume. So what does that mean is that 40 mLs to a ventricle that pumps 160, that's actually not too bad for 40 mLs to a ventricle that only pumps 120 or 80, right? So the denominator is equally important, and that's what the fraction provides. There was no correlation between the infarct size and the ischemic MR, but we saw a very... Uh, important interaction. Let me take you through this graph here. You have these four stratas of infarct size. In patients that did not have a lot of scar, let's say 0 or 15 percent, despite their ischemic cardiomyopathy, if you increase the mitral regurgitation, they increase their risk, but not substantially, as opposed to once you reach this 30 to 45 percent of the LV mass is scar a little bit. You already start from a higher point, but a little bit of increase of MR, you already exponentially increased that risk. And this was an independent um, association with, um, with the outcomes um, to say that in patients that have a lot of MR, but not substantial scar, the yellow curve here, actually they had a survival benefit. That's with invasive open heart surgery, cabbage plus MDR. On the other hand, patients that have a lot of MR but have a lot of SCAR, it doesn't matter what you do. Either they die or they go to transplant or they might go to LVAD. Um, and that is something that we can provide at this current stage. Now, um, the, the disease is in the ventricle, right, for secondary MR, but how do we assess that ventricular health? And this is just a one publication from Germany, 22 patients that received MitroClip. They just got the MRI done before MitroClip. And they looked into the SCAR burden, and this was just yes or no. You have SCAR, you don't have SCAR. Do not quantify. In the absence of SCAR, nine patients, there was a substantial improvement in their New York Heart Association class, as opposed to in those that had myocardial fibrosis, there was a lateral move. They did not change their New York Heart Association class, or they died. And a lot of the events, 69% of the events occur in those that had myocardial fibrosis. So it's something that we ought to pay attention in, particularly uh, when we start to um, have some cases, you know, from our center here that have come back with heart failure. This is a patient that had mitral clip, um, two mitral clips, and then came back with a New York Heart Association class three. He had known cardiomyopathy, but after you give the gadolinium, you can see that there is this mid-wall fibrosis surrounding the entire heart. Um, this is not SCAR related from myocardial infarction, but is a non-ischemic SCAR, and he was tested positive for desmoplakin simutation. Um, so non-ischemic burden of SCAR. This is another patient. You probably saw, recall some of the images before. He had bilateral pleural fusions. He had mitral clips a year before, and uh, he came back with, um, my, with a heart failure. And you can see here on the red arrows, very discrete SCAR, both ischemic and non-ischemic SCAR. Um, he did not have a bad outcome, but again, heart failure readmission in a ventricle that is significantly also fibrotic and thick. 
And this is another patient um, of Manus that um, was sent to evaluate for uh, viability in the presence of RCA and circumflex CTO. And you can see that the amount of scar is not that much, about 5%, but had a lot of mitral regurgitation, despite the low regurgitant volume, again, by the fraction, right? That's important. There was plenty of viability, so the idea is to PCI these vessels and reassess the MR, because the MR might get better. And if not, then we could consider mitral clip. So is it individualized in the therapy to the patients? And this is something that we are working um, and trying to um, with our own center first and then hopefully to a multicentric uh, evaluation because we believe that this will be also an important marker. And part of this uh, editorial by um, Dr. Blaise Carabello for our <laughs> paper, <laughs> that meat doesn't beat or don't beat. Uh, the scar burden was not measured in patients with ischemic MR and mitral FR. Um, and this could be an important player. And it's very sobering to see this data from COEPT that was just published a couple weeks ago. Again, COEPT, a very positive trial, right? You have to have medical therapy and then get the CLIP. You got that survival benefit, uh, heart failure readmissions. But within those that receive mitral CLIP and medical therapy, 54% of them, were classified as non-responders. That is, either they died, they had a heart failure hospitalization, or they had no KCCQ change. So we, we should do better in trying to risk stratify these patients uh, to improve this non-respondence rate. Uh, because the CLIP, in addition to many other things, could be important or even more upstream intervention. And to finalize the future directions, um, just to say that at MHI, you come to a place that you don't need to tell how important cardiac MRI is because there is a lot of folks uh, that have preceded here, including John and Scott, I include Manos as well, including Mike, um, Nick Burke, Tim Henry when he was here, and Barry Marin, of course, uh, for the development of this center of excellence in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well as Paul, um, to many others, to say that cardiac MRI is important, especially for myopathy here. We're now trying to take into new uh, arenas, coronary artery disease, as well as the importance of valvular heart disease. So you come to a place that you don't need to sell how important that is. It's when can you get it done, please? Because uh, that was the demand for us. And we have grown. You saw some parts of these slides at the last week um, when I presented. This partnership has been extremely fruitful. We have been able to decrease scan time, increase availability. There was a little bit of a hit, obviously, as any other place with the COVID, the decrease, but now we are seeing the uptaking of the number of studies and our uh, wait times have improved. Um, and obviously we cannot um, stay still for the time being. We have to continue moving. And the foundation of every state is the education of its youth. And that's what we are planning to now launch is the fellowship for advanced imaging in both CT and MRI. Um, and big thanks here to John, who uh, supported wholeheartedly this, as well as uh, Mike, Mark Newell and uh, Beth Carnes to be able to provide um, this by the next year. We have an amazing number of studies and technologies that we wanted to train the next generation. And uh, we have gotten some very good applicants to this date. And opportunities, obviously, with the expansion to the MHI East. Uh, we had a very productive meeting this last Friday, and I'm very um, hopeful that we will be able to um, join forces together. There's a need for an upgrade that will bring them all these high-end capabilities that I have shown you that we have it available here. Uh, we are uh, excited, obviously, to have common report system imaging protocols share those experiences so that we can double our capacity and doesn't matter where the patient goes, whether here or there, they will get the same good quality study and obviously exposure to research capabilities. Um, and the observations of this place continue to, to grow for me. It's a fun place, it's teamwork. Uh, you come, it doesn't feel like work. Uh, you laugh a lot. You have lots of cups of coffee and new ideas and um, it's, it's so much fun. Um, and, that the passion that we share here is contagious, and I think that's one of our secret sauce. And um, I would like to thank um, all the uh, techs from the MRI, uh, led by Jana, Katie, Adam, and Denise. Um, our socialization before COVID here was quite a lot of fun. 
uh, and this is that CMR uh, when we had the very nice uh, presence there and, and great memories. That was the last meeting before COVID hit mm -hmm. when we could uh, participate uh, in February. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank many others that I uh, am representing here. We'd love to take your questions. Thank you. John. Hi. Can, is, can it be heard? Over? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Joao, unbelievable. Uh, the actual work is so much better than the talk, and the talk was really good. <laughs> Thank you. I, there, in cardiology, it's a very confusing time after the ischemia trial, and we have many options to look for ischemia, and we're not sure, at least I'm not sure, how valuable that is. Where do you place cardiac MRI assessment for ischemia in the global choices that are available in what setting? Now, that's a great question. So, um, and some people say that ischemia killed ischemia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, because it was a neutral trial. Um, mind you that the ischemia was a trial that took more than, I think, six to eight years to be completed. Uh, they had to change the enrollment criteria by several folds, several times to the point that the inclusion of patients with significant ischemia was uh, less than a single digit. So we're not testing so much ischemia. And that's probably why we don't have a representation of that. Medical therapy has evolved as well over the last six to eight years. And when I show you those Kaplan-Meier curves from the MR inform, you have to really zoom in to see a little bit of a difference. Medical therapy works wonders. And we should always think, does this patient need any testing? I am a truly believer, you know, being practicing here for the last two years, that coronary CTA for me is the first test to go for if I have somebody that has chest pain. Unless I have some other concerns. It is, you know, is chest pain plus a ventricle that is thick? It is chest pain plus a valve disease? It's chest pain plus pulmonary hypertension? I need functional evaluation? I go for MRI because I believe in what we have shown here. But coronary CT, it is extremely cost-effective. It's hard to argue for a test that is so cheap. And that has actually played against CT because you don't get reimbursed, you don't do it. We need to uh, promote the awareness. So, and I would encourage you that have been using that. There is a, um, a letter that is going to be available until October 5th to be sent to say we cannot continue to reduce costs and cut costs uh, in reimbursement for CT, cut reimbursement for CT for the last four years. So ischemia did not test ischemia so much. Ischemia had a lot of other problems uh, in its randomization. Um, it did not use modern techniques as well. Uh, as you can see, the, the use of PET or MRI was minimal. Um, so I still believe that coronary artery disease assessment with CT should be the upfront, like what the NICE guidelines have shown. But if you have a, the other questions to be answered, please go into that one. Scott. Um, thank you, Joel. A uh, great talk, as usual. But um, in kind of contrast to what John asked, I'd ask you a similar kind of overview of viability testing before revascularization. What's your current view of that situation? Yeah, so viability is not only about how much transmural infarction you have um, or the transmolality of that, so how much scar do you have. Viability in large part is that, but also is the contractile uh, force of that ventricle. Um, and so some have said that perhaps you could have a lot of viability, but if that ventricle is so far stretched and remodeled, you could have a lot of viability, but that ventricle might not come back. There's a point of no return. We still don't know what that is. Um, there have been some attempts to use MIBG by a nuclear denervation. Could this be even you know, more upstream than the development of LV dysfunction, or even in those for LV dysfunction for response. The assessment of viability is still being done the same way, but I'm a believer that we ought to consider other players as well, and particularly the ventricular remodeling that is subtended by that. The chronicity of that process, uh, and perhaps could you consider doing a dobutamine uh, to see what is the contractile improvement of that, or when you do a stress viability too, um, could you see an increase in the contractility after you have given the stress? It's a much more complicated question. Viability is not only you have or don't have transmural infarct. John, you have any other? No, I just had another question. <laughs> okay. Yes. In whom would you 
believe would be the best referral for quantification of blood flow? And, and who is it not necessary? So I think the ones that would be the best referral are patients that you have already excluded epicardial coronary disease. You have done the CT, the patient still remains with angina-like or chest pain-like symptoms. Uh, you'll be surprised that lots of stents, it keeps the vessel like, like a rigid, you know, and these patients cannot augment the myocardial blood flow. In patients that have significant hypertrophy as well, increase LV mass by hypertension, chronic kidney disease. These patients don't augment flow. In patients that have a suspicion for microvascular disease, obese, diabetics, um, you know, women with half PEF, uh, those would be uh, good ones. And I would say even for those patients that have established coronary disease, that you are equivocal about the severity on the angiogram. We have not done the FFR, but you know, is this significant or not? I would, I would think that sometimes those patients could benefit from ischemia assessment, just like the CTO patients too, that you know, collaterals can provide some of it, but not necessarily they are that ischemic to it. Manos. Hello again, congratulations, phenomenal presentation. A uh, quick question, if patients with coronary disease who get an MR, so almost get viability and ischemia, based on what you said, or is there, I mean, why not get ischemia unless uh, it's an issue of time? Uh, that's a great question. So thank you for bringing that up, and that's why I put that slide. Should all patients with viability get ischemia, right? Um, it currently, that's not the way we operate because it increases by another 15 minutes or so, the time, and obviously the patient preparation because if you're going to do ischemia testing with ragdenazone or adenosine, you've got to be caffeine-free for 24 hours uh, because otherwise it would not work out. So you have to prepare that patient, and we cannot do. But you know, this is something that we're planning to introduce, hopefully 2021, um, so that we could streamline that. We reduce the wait times. I think that would be extremely beneficial to your point. They should get both ischemia and viability assessment, and you get a comprehensive evaluation for that. Absolutely. Uh, Joe, yeah. great talk. Uh, that may not be a, a very smart question like my um, other colleagues here, <laughs> but uh, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, patients with mic microvascular disease with no detectable uh, large epicardial vessel disease that present with, uh, uh, with angina, are those patients, majority of them, patients with severely depressed EF, normal EF, somewhere in the middle, just some kind of like, for uh -huh. somebody like me, it's sure. kind of it really, oh, this is probably somebody like this. So you'd be surprised. Majority of them actually have preserved systolic function. Uh, they come uh, on not infrequently to your to our clinic, not your clinic, but your clinic. Uh, they have chest pain. Sometimes, actually, it's uh, supratentorial. It's uh, not, you know, in the heart. Uh, but you know, they have been mislabeled um, as you know they have other psychiatric issues, and you'll be surprised that uh, once you make the diagnosis, um, you can you know then be more customized to. Some of them have a more vasospastic component to that microvascular. Disease. Some of them will have a much more, you know, post-capillary uh, issues that you know will require some more vasodilators to it, to it uh, less than vasospastic. But majority of them have preserved systolic function. In presence of uh, non-obstructive coronary disease, it's an important marker. 20, 30, 50 percent lesions here and there, here and there. They would add it up to that. Um, process. Can you imagine the, the diagnostic challenge that they face. It's yeah, and. Crazy. Right? Until now, as a big, as a big picture. until now you would say, oh, you don't have anything. You've done a coronary CT, you have no obstruction, but I still have in those symptoms. Come on, you know, help me out here. So, yes, to your point, that's excellent. John? Yes, just uh, one online question, and the question is, uh, is there any rationale or are there any limitations in assessing microvascular disease in patients with revascularized epicardial coronary disease who still have class 3 to 4 mm -hmm. angina? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was about, you know, assessing microvascular dysfunction in those that have known multivascular disease and have been previously revascularized. Those are actually the ones that we would love to assess. Um, those are the ones that, you know, have obviously not been included in some of those, are the ones that we, we have fun, um, <laughs> so to speak, because they have infarcts, and then you can see um, how much of that myocardial blood flow they can augment. And sometimes you'll be surprised. There is a graft that does not supply, and you can go after. But they start already with a very high pretest likelihood. So you're more 
than likely to find microvascular dysfunction in these patients. And the doors are open for us to test for that very safely. Thank you. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming, and have a great week. <laughs>